Instead of trying to just continually be on the pursuit of happiness and extract joy and your sense of safety, to make your life an expression of joy and to make your life an expression of freedom. What it looks like to actually show up in relationship to others, not needing them to be anything or anyone for you, just fully accepting them for who they are. That, I think, is the most powerful place that you can operate. You celebrate somebody else's wins and joys without making it about yourself. And without making it that you're less than. And this is why I think that you're so needed in today's world. Because you have a special soul that is leadership from behind the throne. And it's a new paradigm of leadership. Understanding and learning deeply the process of what to do with your awareness in meditation. Not just sitting down and being still or quiet for 15 minutes, but really knowing what that looks like. Knowing what to do with your mind, with your thought process, with your awareness, so that you can actually taste stillness. We just had a moment where there were no words, but our souls got to reconnect from the same rhythm. It was like an unspoken rhythm that started pulsing through, me, through you and then through me, and then one of your friends, but our friends reflected back saying, it was like you guys were like merging, I didn't know where you began and you ended and it was it's just this, this, this merging through the, the handpan. So I brought the handpan down today and we could just close out this podcast with, with sharing a little bit of handpan music and being able to play and pray together in a good way. Let's do it. <laughs>
He is also the founder of Meraki Media, which is supporting to put a professional frame around people that have heart-centered voices to share their message with the world. So it's a production company that supports with podcasters. And now everybody and their mama got a podcast, but Andre only aligns himself with people that are really speaking from the heart of people whose messages he truly firmly believes in. And so being able to support more voices of the heart getting out into the masses. As well as that, he is also the host of his own podcast, the Know Thyself Podcast. Oh my goodness, have I ever did see anything grow so fast, so quickly than the Know Thyself Podcast. The level of professionalism, consistency, and deep study with every single guest that he has on is so inspiring to me and also a little triggering at times because he's triggering me into my greatness with my own podcast which I absolutely love so I'm here for it Um, as well as that he is a community bringer of all of the brilliant minds together Um, he weaves this weaves this community with an impeccable nature of um, bringing incredible heart-centered leaders together and creating a forward focused motion of what it is that we're creating practical solutions um, as a community as well as he is the founder of a brotherhood that he has brought brilliant minds together to weave the brothers of this community into a deeper place of healing and a safety for them to be able to thrive and grow and serve there are so many things that this miraculous human is doing i could like I have a whole laundry list of excitement around what he is creating, but I'll let the rest of the podcast speak for itself. Andre Dukin, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Heck of an intro. I know, <laughs> but it's true. It's all it's, the thing. Yeah, thank you. It's cool. It's interesting. I'm usually the interviewer. I don't have onto other people's podcasts too much. Um, so it's cool to re- reflect, get that reflection back. And I just appreciate you. And thank you for always seeing me and just reflected, reflecting back everything that you said to me a thousand times to you. Forever and always, I'm going to be one of your biggest fans. That's just the, that's just the default. <laughs> that is just the way that it's going to be. Likewise. And also, I think that people are really interested in, specifically people that have been listening to my podcast for many years and been a part of our journey and have now also been listening to your podcast. They're interested in our journey of our relationship. Um, and we have done a podcast on your on the Know Thyself podcast when we went through our separation and we did almost like a two hour long podcast of all of the intricacies of what we could share and extract the gold from our experience together. Um, And I had so many incredible reflections from people that have been navigating what we'd like to call conscious uncoupling um, and how to do it in a place of remaining and keeping the grace alive and intact. And so that they've given reflections to me that the podcast says been so illuminating during times where it was desperately needed it and for me that is why we share vulnerably is to genuinely become medicine for other people and I think that the only way that that medicine can translate to others is if it's genuinely embodied and one of my greatest relationships whether it's from partnership with you and transitioned into a friendship it's one of my greatest relationships I know to date because we have navigated all different types of terrain and genuinely resting in a place of respect for each other. Now, with you being a host of the Know Thyself podcast, you're the one asking the questions. So like you just said, putting you now in the position where you are being asked the questions and um, I wanna pull out a little bit more vulnerability from you. I wanna like really understand who Andre be behind the scenes, what makes Andre tick, what are the things or the tools that have supported you to live the life that you live, and also simultaneously how you navigate such um, intimate, um, vulnerable waters specifically within uh, your relationships and specifically within how we've been able to navigate our relationship and move into such a deep, close bond that feels really good and really clean. Um, So of course, there's many, many questions within (laughs) that. I'm gonna narrow it down first and foremost. How do you find it, um, or uh, probably best way to address this, as you navigate, continue to weave directly close with me now in community, in co-creations, how have you been able to navigate a personal relationship from a deep place of grace and what does grace actually mean to you? Mm. <laughs> There's a lot to open up here. There's like, there's been a whole journey with you and this whole, you know, whether, whatever people want to call it, breaking up, consciously breaking up, conscious uncoupling. When you weave romantically with somebody so deeply for many years, your energies twine in so many different ways. You become each other in many different ways. You pick up on each other. Um, We became such 
more liberated versions in the presence of each other through our partnership. And, you know, it becomes the continual choice to choose love over fear um, and to show up with grace in all of the moments after the relationship separates to still show up with love. And, you know, because it's been a long journey over the past, what, couple years of us. I mean, five years now. Yeah. So after separating, you know, we kind of talked a little bit on that previous podcast that we did. Uh, P.S. The previous podcast that we did, I couldn't even get past the intro before crying. I was still pretty raw on that one. I feel like I'm now in a bit more of an integrated place. But in that in that episode, there was still so much rawness. There was so much beauty that came from that rawness. But I feel like now we're even in a, a stage that's even more developed. Anyway, keep going. Mm hmm. Yeah, so even since that podcast, there's been many different opportunities, I think, for both of us to navigate being in community together with other connections that come in, potential other partnerships or lovers, um, navigating, you know, being in similar, obviously very intertwined communities, having business opportunities, like very much so our paths in life are kind of like parallels on the highway like next the lanes are next to each other with the podcast that we create the way that we want to share and you know uplift society and raise consciousness on the planet so much of it is just you know a strong theme for both of us so with that uh we've been you know consistently been, been mirrors for each other but i suppose to, to answer your question what it means to really show up for grace and you know the after periods especially of our dynamic is simultaneously fully honoring the human emotion that feels whatever it might feel when you see your previous partner, if there's still emotions, if there's still feelings, if there's anything unresolved at all, to fully feel that, to, to communicate that honestly, how it best serves and to choose who you want to be in the moment. You know, somebody that can honor the fullness of their, of their shadow and still choose to show up uh, in a way of service, in a way of honoring. To me, that's somebody who shows up with grace. And uh, that's when you show up with grace, then you're not susceptible to later down the line regretting so much of things. Because when you feel and you, you're really moving with grace, you're doing the best that you can. So that's what it feels like to me. There have been times where there has been an accumulation of unspoken something. And I think that there's a, a joint sensitivity to that. And what I have learned from you is that I have never actually learned, I don't think from anybody else fully, is that it's safe for me to have my process. You have given me the privilege of my process. And what that means to me is that when I have over time shown a little bit more vulnerability of what stories I've attached myself to that's creating suffering for myself, and I've opened it up, it's only been met with love and acceptance and a deep level of listening without a defensiveness in return. Now that sweet combination is like a formula that actually reprograms my nervous system that says I'm safe for me to feel whatever stories I'm running that is creating me suffering and being witnessed in that and being loved for it helps me to transmute the stories myself and so there's been multiple times where I have felt stories accumulating and I have said Andre let, let's have a conversation we've had multiple points where we've had very transparent real conversations and left no stone unturned in the moment and in that, what it did is it diffused the potential where we could have separated because of, of stories that have not allowed us to come back together. So I'm curious around what have you done or have studied or is it just your nature to accept within me the stories I've presented to you and met them without resistance or needing to defend your character? Because that in itself is a lifelong journey to be able to get to that place. And so it that formula can only be accessed when you've done the own, your own internal work. So what does it mean for you to witness somebody without judging their process specifically when there's a tie in romantic partnership? Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a great question. And, you know, maybe we can even got, go into some of the nuance too of certain examples of it to make it more tangible for people as well. But just to answer your question, there were, there are continually innumerable opportunities to choose who you want to show up in that space. And when you say, what have I done? Or if, if it's just my nature, you know, I would assert that it's actually all of our nature deep down. That's who we intrinsically are. Our essence is filled with love, wants to share it in that way. And yet we have all of these protection coping mechanisms 
And it's really how we often come into connection with other people is through the lens of self-protection. We deeply are identified with being somebody. And with that, there is perceived threat all around us. And so when somebody, especially in romantic partnership, comes up, comes to you with something, some issue, um, some concern, something they're even just working through, which is often the case, it's their own process. There can't be, there's no defensiveness when there, when you don't feel there's anything to defend. If you come to me with something and it, it's really a reflection of a core vulnerability that you're sharing or a wound or something that you're moving through, to show up as, a, as somebody who's really a presence of love, which is something that I'm committed to and I'm sure many of your listeners are committed to, then uh, it's, it's discerning and revealing what it means to actually listen to somebody. So often we're listening through the lens of self-protection. What is the perceived threat? And it's primal, it's deep within ourselves and within our brain to uh, notice where there might be threat. And so the more that we remove and let go of the feel and the need to cling on to that identity, then the more that we can actually really be with somebody. This is one of the things that actually came up within earlier in our relationship is there was one kind of thing that I was working through within the first year is uh, perceiving you through the lens of how I wanted to see you. And that it was a sad realization for me because you're actually not really connecting with somebody when you're in that space. You're connecting with the facade that you've mentally created about them, the thoughts and feelings and emotions, perceptions that you have of them, not actually who they are. And so I choose as best as I can, not always flawlessly, but whenever there is an opportunity for me to show up in that space, I choose to show up in that space, kind of zooming out and saying, you know, this isn't a, uh, you're bringing something to me that is revealing an issue of mine. You're revealing something that you're working through at a deep fundamental level. How can I be just a space of loving and of love and, and listening to you deeply and seeing what you're trying to communicate um, really through yourself and not just to me and how I might want to perceive it. So I think fundamentally it comes back to learning how to listen, just really actually learning how to listen and pay attention without the lens of self-protection creating a barrier between you and the other person. And with that, then depending on the circumstance, and we can maybe go through a couple of what those have been, whatever those triggers are, uh, it, like I said, it's just, I feel like a process of, of choosing to show up with love and, um, you know, realizing that those core wounds are very analogous to a child that doesn't feel safe, a child that is worried about its own survival, a, ch a child that just wants to be held and oftentimes just wants to be witnessed in that space and known that it's going to be accepted and not judged. Mm -hmm. oh, it's like even just within you sharing, it just is such a deep invitation for how I wish to continue to move forward in relationship. And I think that the greatest place of growth is in romantic partnership from my personal experience, because I was thinking about it the other day. It's like, huh, I think I'm evolving. I'm not as triggered as much. If like, nah, bitch, it's because you're single. Like, you're spending so much time alone. <laughs> like, you ain't got nobody triggering you. <laughs> like, of course. And I was like, oh, yeah. All right, let's sit back down for a second. The second thing I, I have something figured out, it's just really merely because I'm just spending a significant amount of time in my hermit archetype. And so it's like, wow, okay, cool. Not as many triggers anymore. Um, however, to be witnessed by somebody from the moment that you wake up to the moment that you go to bed, <laughs> even like walking in and someone's on the toilet, you know, it's like, oh, hey, what's up? Or brush your teeth while someone else is taking a shit. Like, this is intimate. Like, this is like way after a year in, you know, after the sort of the honeymoon phase and you, you got yourself all presented this buffet version of you that's like, oh, yeah, and I like to do this and, and I'm going to speak really articulated so that you think that I've got my shit together. <laughs> <laughs> and actually like okay you're in and not slept for a couple of days and you've like been purging all night because you've got food poisoning and you're like oh, mascara is all down the side of your face and you just feel like shit and you've left a pile of laundry over somewhere else and and like this is actually the real real and i feel like within the real real this is actually where so much growth and so much potential can happen now something that i have noticed is that it requires both of us to be in a deep level of full ownership of our triggers and I have been in an experience where there is not that from the other side and so there's a frustration that can happen when 
one person is willing to do the work and take full ownership and the other person isn't and, and this is what i m- mainly see is why relationships can't have a conscious uncoupling um and that's something that you and i have been able to have within our conversations is no matter what triggers present themselves usually me <laughs> so i'm the one that gets triggered more um I have been able to address it from a place of this is my experience and this is the story that I'm telling myself around what is. Now from that lens, no longer do you feel attacked um, and therefore then the defensiveness doesn't need to present itself because there's a level of ownership. So moving forward, how do you, if you were to give context or just place your wisdom in what it means for both people to take full ownership of their experience, if you can break that down of what that means to you. Well, I think it goes back to you can't fully take ownership if you're still in a way looking to other for fulfilling all your needs. And hold on, there's something that's just like pretty packed piece. <laughs> we enter relationships thinking that somebody else is supposed to fill our needs and yeah. we're starting the first domino from a place of codependency. Yeah. There is so much to unpack in that one mm-hmm. sentence. Keep going, but yeah. like that is that's that's deep in our dating mm-hmm. life and our, the way that we perceive life, which is almost like starting off on the wrong foot. For sure. Yeah. Well, you could assert it's necessary for a certain stage of development to then reveal what you don't want your experience of life to be like than to, you know, be that experience, that mirror of what your own inadequacies, perceived inadequacies are and then you can heal them and then you can come into truly relating with another person which is this new paradigm of connecting in romantic relationship where there's two holes instead of two halves that need to complete each other two holes coming together and experiencing the joy of being with each other and i think this is a big shift with how you can actually be in healthy relation with other human beings whether it's romantic or not is to instead of trying to just continually be on the pursuit of happiness and extract joy and your sense of safety and home externally to make your life a to make your life an expression of joy and to make your life an expression of freedom what it looks like to actually show up in relationship to others not needing them to be anything or anyone for you just fully accepting them for who they are and that i think is the most powerful place that you can operate from that's how you can really connect with others that's how you can really show up and uh, be in service to the planet you know, I think so So often we have this idea of impact in the world being the scale of impact that we have and the numbers and the followers and how big the podcast is, how big you sell your business for, all these different things. And it's a very Western-minded view of impact. But you can have an incredibly immense amount of impact on the world simply by liberating yourself from these old, outdated identities and egos to come into uh really showing up just with kindness, with authenticity, with honesty, and sh- making your life, you know, a, a real expression of freedom. So it's a new, it's, it's something that's foreign to most people. Hopefully most people have gotten a taste of it at some point in their life. Maybe it was through a parent um, or a relative or a friend. But I think ultimately we're all on that path of coming home and discovering that freedom that is innate. And then our life gets to be an expression of freedom instead of seeking it or seeking something, seeking freedom in the form of something. It almost always works, but it never fully does. And so it's, yeah, it's coming back to self-sourcing that, which uh, is easier said than done, but it's the worthwhile journey to embark on. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> As you're sharing, it constantly inviting me to review myself. And after our separation, it made me realize that there was so much of my life that I was still grasping on for validation from outside. And during this time of being single, that has been the most important piece for me is where there is a longing to fulfill something that only I can fulfill. And you and I have had multiple conversations since we've separated, even after the podcast that we did, where there has still been a part of me that is trying to hold on to the safety that I felt within our dynamics. Um, I experienced a relationship after hours that was brief, but was not a safe place um, eventually over time. Which we didn't really talk about too much on the podcast. And for those that wanted me to be more, I saw some comments like, I want Andre to like open up and share a little bit more vulnerably. We really couldn't talk about that whole phase too, because just for various reasons, you know, you got into another relationship fairly, fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, And just because of the nature of it, we can't really talk about it a whole lot Mm -hmm. or choose not to. But um, 
yeah, that was a whole, that was a whole phase, one of many that, you know, that brought that up for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge, important part of my journey of really actually reclaiming who I am for myself. And I think that I had no idea that I was running this perception because I had been in partnership, extremely loving partnership for seven, for seven, almost seven years from between Amir and you. And so I didn't realize that a lot of my validation was outsourced. And it makes sense going back, like for, for all of us, you know, our relationship to our mothers and knowing ourselves through the eyes of our mother for the first three, four years of our life. We know that we're doing good or bad based off of her map of consciousness of what she thinks is good and bad and how she responds, her relationship to control, her relationship to to um, herself ultimately then passed on to the child. And then therefore that stuff, that curriculum that we need to, tr to work through in our personal experience before we have children and therefore continue to do the healing so that we don't pass on our trauma to our children and so I got to really really review once I was in partnership with somebody it was a, a partnership that actually wasn't a safe place for my process or experience and realized in the absence of any relationship over the past eight months or so where I'm outsourcing my sense of joy my sense of self-validation my sense of self and starting to create crave the safety that I felt with you because I wasn't giving it to myself and what I noticed on a subtle energetic level is that when there's a grasping or a longing the word longing is actually probably the best word for it even if I'm standing in a space with you and I'm not saying a single thing but internally I'm going oh I miss him so much oh, I wish I wish wish we could experience this again together or whatever it is that the internal conversation is what it does is it creates this energetic push and pull because there's it's almost like a magnet that's used the opposite magnet you know how it repels and then when it's used actually in the in in the the north and south pole it balance and it actually attracts and so I got to really understand what energetics do to the space even without saying a single word and that is the refinement of the internal process and the way that I'm speaking to myself around what is. That has been one of the greatest gifts that you have gifted me in the absence of our relationship is returning my energy back to myself and doing it on a daily practice and a consistency. Um, I would, I'm curious around how you navigate that push and pull energy internally and you return your energy back to yourself of a sovereign being, no longer looking for validation outside of ourselves. Because one thing I can consistently feel across the board, whenever I ask anybody about their relationship dynamics or their partnerships of people um, that they choose to dance with in this life, is that it is a constant dance between that push and pull energy that we're navigating. How do you return your energy back to yourself so that you can genuinely enter any partnership from a place of wholeness as opposed to desiring validation externally yeah well i think for most people part of the journey of getting to that place is actually experiencing that push and pull experiencing what it's to to really truly desire and work towards having unconditional love you probably will experience a lot of conditional love <laughs> and so and would it, you say most love is conditional love yeah and, and you know it, it just you know, love is one of those words where it's it's got so many different meanings based off where people are at in their own life and in the world. Um, you know, I feel very much so and how I would like to use it is really recognizing the other as self and, um, and sharing in that presence together. You know, I think that there was many, I mean, there's many times where, especially because both of us are so sensitive and we both feel each other very deeply we know each other very well. If there's anything that's unspoken in the space, it's felt immediately. There doesn't really need to be <laughs> anything said. <laughs> like the other day, I was like a little salty because of a text message that he sent me and I may have misinterpreted it through a personal lens of defense mechanism. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I did, maybe I didn't. Um, but like I gave him a hug and I was like withholding a bit of my love. And like within three minutes, he was like, are we good? <laughs> are you okay? And I was like, I'm annoyed. <laughs> but you like tracked it immediately. I was like... This man knows me so well. He actually knows me better than I know myself. Anyway, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that's part of the process of being in a mirror, you know, in a relationship with other people is I was even just talking to a, a good friend who's been 
brilliant wisdom filled mind also very much so a lone wolf kind of loves to be on his own be in his own energy often like myself kind of very happy to be in my own little you know bubble of bliss that i create for myself in my own home and in my own flow and he's been doing that for a while and uh you know one of the big realizations for him is to explore and taste what it's like again to go into community to move back closer to la to experience uh, the reflection through partnership and, you know, true freedom isn't when you feel free off in a cave in the Himalayas, but when you're truly tested with all the possible triggers that would have habitually triggered you and to still feel freedom in the face of partnership, in the face of romantic, in the face of, you know, connections and, and kids. And when you can really, when you feel it in that space, then it's like, okay, that that's really when you get to that point of, of feeling resolved. So, you know, everybody's path is different. And I feel like for me, self-sourcing that own validation, I would, I would say that it was a lack of need to, for anything to validate. Like they're, you know, coming to that place where there's, there's not an identity that needs to be validated in the first place. So it's not really fun at trying to solve the issue of being validated, but dissolving the ego or identity that feels a need to, to be, be validated at any point it's like recognizing your own inherent worth and again it's part of the path of just living life and trying to trying to reach out and feeling that longing external to fill what we feel the lack of in, inside uh, but the 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 place of real true power i feel like is when you recognize your inherent worth because it is inherent if you're alive you're worthy there's nothing you have to do or be or say to become worthy of the love that you are you just have to experience it. And so again, for me, it's been a process of removing those layers of really a practice of stillness, you know, and, and meant, you know, you know, this of just like my, my commitment to practice and devotion to sadhana and uh, using life as it is the continual mirror and opportunity to choose who you want to be. And through that, you know, and I've been on this path for a while, maybe people are familiar with my podcast, you know, coming out the past year, but it's been a journey of 10 plus years of personal development and on this path and studying and learning more about myself. And now people see it more in the light. And uh, I'm definitely not, you know, proposing that I have all the answers, that I have it all figured out. Um, I genuinely do feel like I live my life from a state of joy the vast majority of time. And that's been a process of, of letting go more than it has been garnering something. Deborah Silverman said to me once um, that lucky people are the ones that live under the correct laws of the universe. And I feel like it's so easy from the outside in to look at your life and to go, God, that dude's lucky. Oh, he's just like figured it out. I believe that you, of course, are human. And I have in the past pedestal, do you just because I just. I mean, I personally been able to spend three years in a very intimate setting with you and walk out of that with nothing but respect. That is very telling. And I believe that things work in a peaceful manner and a harmonious manner because you're living under the correct laws of the universe. And that internal navigation and your discernment of what is the correct laws of the universe, yes, has come from trial and error. And secondly, I think that you have a very special soul. And I say the word special, not to mean better, but special. Special doesn't necessarily mean better. It doesn't mean above. But special allows for certain people around you to start to remember where their North Star is for themselves. And that's the gift that you give to others. And so there is a way that you operate and live your life that seems lucky from the untrained eye but is actually living under the correct laws of the universe. And therefore, that's why I think that it's so inspiring to have you as a guest on the podcast, not just hosting. And that's why whenever you ask me, like, what should I share? I want, I'm like, want more of you. Because I know since I met you, it's not ever been about you. And I, the testament of that is that you wanted to create your podcast. You wanted to be able to share your wisdom that's been cultivated over a plus time of a decade and yet what you did for me as a gift on my birthday was build me a podcast set and you put I'm gonna get me emotional again you put professional lenses on me um and asked for nothing in return when it was what you wanted for yourself and 
most people want something because they want it for themselves. And you gave me an opportunity to share my message. Because you love, genuinely love me. And this is just one of the reasons why I will forever be one of your biggest fans. <laughs> because your heart is good. And you live in Los Angeles where everybody wants to be somebody. And you celebrate somebody else's wins and joys without making it about yourself. And without making it that you're less than. And this is why I think that you're so needed in today's world. Because you have a special soul that is leadership from behind the throne. And it's a new paradigm of leadership that is so important and so rare. The more I travel around the world, the more I meet people, the more I realize how rare it is. And it's so easy for, for me to to be in the bubble of just like like-minded humans that are all genuinely doing their best that they can to make their decisions from a place of love. And so it's easy to create this confirmation bias that this is just the way life is. And I think everybody lives in a bubble. The, whether you go to England or you go travel to Thailand, everybody's in their own bubble. So yes, we live in a bubble in Los Angeles. But within that bubble, there is a piercing truth that permeates your vessel through your words, through your actions and through your deeds that I will continue to be the encouragement of more of you. And it's not necessarily about the you as your own identity, but the you that is your path of your life. And I would love to to hear a little bit more about what are the practices of consistency that you apply to your everyday life to ensure that your decisions made in the heat of the moment continue to live on even though the emotion of the moment has passed. Thank you so much. Love you so much. That was really beautiful. I just fully received. And um, for everybody that's listening, one of Blue's absolute clear superpowers is, is her ability to see others and to reflect the beauty that she sees in others. And she just melts the hearts of everybody that she comes in contact with in community because she really operates from that place of seeing and reflecting beauty, you know. Whereas we were speaking to earlier, a lot of people navigate from the place of comparison. And of course, we all can fall into traps of doing this at times as well. But um, I see more often than not just really sharing the beauty that you see around and reminding people of that instead of reminding people of their own inadequacy or comparison. Uh, you really show people um, and remind them that of that beauty. So just thank you so much. And yeah, you know, the podcast set or, you know, in partnership, I just always want the people that I care about most and the people that are close to me to to thrive, to prosper for more of their medicine to get out in the world. And so for me, it feels like a joy to be able to do that and weave like that. Um, it feels like a, a gift for me to to give to others in that space, which is then therefore a gift to the world. And so, yeah, that's what I'll say about that. But just appreciate you. And yeah the, I suppose with your question you know you we were speaking to a little bit about the lucky ones are the people that live under the laws of the universe right so to me it feels like yeah <clears throat> the correct laws of the universe yeah so it's really I feel like just simply aligning our nature with nature's nature the actual na natural world plant animal kingdom we have evolve to be in connection and communion with that so that is part of us it's part of ourself with a capital s it's more more expanded than this just limited body i think so oftentimes we grow up we are ident identified with our name our caste or creed our ethnicity this body this mind our thoughts at a deep fundamental level and the more uh disconnected that we are from nature the more chaos that we feel, the more suffering that we feel. When we go back into the natural world and we experience, and I was just on a hike this morning, suddenly your problems don't have less power over you because you realize you're the 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 seemingly <laughs> the 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 insignificant insignificance of them compared to the vast expanse in which you live, and you're also getting all these bio this biofeedback and signals from the world. So, like that is one thing that simply connecting back into nature gives us and reminds us of our own true nature. Um, and I try to set up my life 
best as I can to optimize for my mind, body, and spirit to be in its nature. By going to bed when I know uh, is best for me, and when I say that, I mean when the time I go to bed, when I wake up in the morning feeling like I can really be of service, show up with my gifts, feel clarity of mind. When you're not well rested, your willpower goes way, way through the floor. Um, you're more likely to overeat. Uh, you know, your your willpower is just really shot in so many different aspects of your life. And life just kind of has a more grim outlook. Like you feel less uh, optimistic about life simply by maybe getting an hour less of proper good sleep with your natural circadian rhythm under the correct laws of the universe. That's just one example of sleeping and, and giving ourselves the nourishment that we need from sleep to then show up and your outlook and perception of life will completely change. You know, so that goes through so many different aspects of life from what we're putting in our body, from what we're putting on our body, from the time we go to sleep, from realizing the deep primal human emotional need for community and connection and proper relationships. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, meditation has been one of the biggest practices where if you start in the morning and, you know, you can have a couple times throughout the day where you make it a more, um, you make it a more at first, maybe rigid, committed, devoted thing. And then it becomes something that you just want to do because you realize the joy and the, the effervescence that it brings to your life. And so, yeah, it's, it's just really paying attention to how you feel when you're operating and, and moving in the world and taking actions um, that are going to be best and, and aligned under that correct law for you. And it's not that complicated. You know, most of us know what it is. We just have this hedonistic habitual tendency to go back into pleasure seeking and the quick dopamine hits, which just uh, has a deleterious cascade down your whole system. And, and the, it's just, you know, starting your your morning and your and ending your nights the proper way really create a, a powerful framework for your life and so for me that's what i feel like is the biggest thing is giving my body what it needs especially as i'm winding down I'm not on instagram i'm not on my phone i'm like in my meditation room i'm rolling out just giving myself that space and it's incredible what happens when you give yourself time without stimulus so much new insights solutions to problems you were thinking on, ideas that come through. Um, and then also just getting familiarized with your own being and what it's like to be in your own presence is such a gift. And you don't get that if you're constantly being stimulated. So that's really important to guard that at the nighttime. And then also same thing in the morning, you know, having your rituals and the practices for me, it's consistently just getting hydrated, getting sunlight, getting movement and getting my meditation in. And like, those are, I think, four things that are really important for everybody that everybody will benefit from before you plug into the world, before you go. And even if just a slight glance at your phone, it reinforces this notion of self. Not only are there emails and texts and social media DMs and things that are on there that people want your attention, but you're also reinforcing the identity of me being a somebody that has to go and, and account and do all these things. So that is just spreading and and building momentum towards the negative especially right in the morning as well not just obviously the tension and anxiety that comes with the phone and everything that's on it but also who you take yourself to be in the world so i think that's a really important frame for people to understand as well and uh and so yeah there's innumerable ways but for me it's like really uh aligning my nature with nature's nature i feel like is the biggest thing I've heard people, and I've talked about it myself, the importance of the first domino that we push in the morning. However, I haven't heard it be related to like being somebody first thing in the morning. And that's a new lens and a new frame of emptying ourselves out. And Ram Dass talks about that of in a world of everybody trying to be somebody, what would it look like to be nobody? And to be that hollow bone and that hollow bone is created over consistency and created over ritual and i think something that we are deprived of in today's society is ritual is is a rite of passage of what it means to actually uh, be somebody that is grounded my mentally physically and spiritually and if we don't have a prayer or a connection with something greater than ourselves then our connection with something greater than ourselves will be through distraction and through those short serotonin hits and the dopamine hits that we can get and i've learned also that continuing to follow those dopamine hits 
eventually over time through the nature of anything you need more and more of it to be able to access the same point and so it is like a very sticky web that it's like getting caught up and wound in which then one action leads to another action which leads to another action and then further and further away it is to achieve the same sensation or feeling and so that's essentially what leads into addiction addiction in many different forms and i think that addiction has become normalized in today's society that when somebody for example, is drinking coffee every single morning or needing a glass of wine every single night before bed. It just becomes norm what we do. And we watch our parents ex- exhibit it and go, oh, our parents do it. So this is what's normal. And what that addiction is, is it's, it's hidden, whether it's in the bread that we eat that is drenched in sugar. Um, that that hit that we get from eating is a byproduct of being disconnected from ritual and di- being disconnected from an education around um, how the brain works and the chemistry of the brain. So a lot of your path or a lot of your small decisions and your small acts that then contribute to who you are in a general, like uh, the the default of who you are, has come from education and study. What were the main pieces? Because of course there's intuitive wisdom, but there's also that you read books every single night before you go to sleep right or like for the most part you're studying a lot you've been in the deep teaching of sad gurus practices what are the main pieces of education study or insight that has crossed your path has been the piece that has significantly been integrated into who you are today Mm -hmm. yeah so there's a lot that i could bring up there first i just want to mention when i so marianne williamson has this quote of you can either endure the sharp the sharp pain of self-discovery or the dull pain of unconsciousness, which would endure for the rest of your life. Oftentimes when you nip it in the bud first thing in the morning, or you choose the discomfort of going in, you know, sitting down to write your book or whatever it is, it's just that kind of sharp pain of ripping off the bandaid oftentimes because we have this habitual tendency to just do what is comfortable. But once the more you do that, the more that you realize that there is something actually inherently pleasant about the concentrated mind. When a mind that is concentrated on a task is like there's something inherently pleasant about it. The distracted mind, there is something inherently unpleasant about it. Now you are getting the dopamine and so there's that pleasant, you know, pleasurable experience, but it doesn't have a good after effect. It has a bitter aftertaste in your mouth. And so for me, it's like, it's really important. And I've been just playing more and more with um, that concentrated mind and, and, and discovering the pleasure that comes with focusing your mind and your attention on whatever it is that you're doing, bringing that full presence. Earlier on in my path to answer your question, I feel like it was much more of a pursuit of self-improvement. So a lot of the books were around personal development um, and so much of that was fundamental into how I operate and weave in the world. So I'm grateful for all of it. Self-acceptance on the other hand is the other side of it, which can be more profound than self-improvement. And so I wouldn't say there's any one thing, text, person, idea, practice that has contributed the most to my path. It's been, I've been privileged and I do, even though I'm operating under the correct laws of the universe as much as possible, I do feel like the luckiest man on earth. Like I feel so grateful for the life that I live and for the opportunities that I have to share my gifts, to weave community, to so so much of it. So I'm just so grateful for it. I can't take credit for it. I feel like earlier on in my journey, I had this idea of what do I want to create from life? What do I want to make of life? And now it's switching a little bit more to like, what does life want to create from me? What does life want to make through me? And it's a subtle shift, but it's a deeper surrender into listening and to paying attention to the gifts that life, God, creator, the universe has given to us. And then it's now our responsibility to give those gifts back to life in our unique way. That is the unique individuation of God of how it expresses itself through us. And so getting deeper and deeper clarity of how life is trying to use me in the best way. How can I be of greatest use of life? That to me feels like a really exciting life. And one that once you find that alignment, life gives you the most amount of abundance possible because you're aligning yourself with nature's nature, which if you look around, if you paid attention, it's pretty damn abundant. Nature is incredibly abundant. And the more that we align ourselves with it, the more that we get that reflection back to us. And so, you know, the most fundamental, if I had to pick a couple, you know, um, powerful things for me has been understanding 
and learning deeply the process of what to do with your awareness in meditation. Like actually like they're not just sitting down and being still or quiet for 15 minutes, but really knowing what that looks like, knowing what to do with your mind, with your thought process, with your awareness so that you can actually taste stillness. It's sad that most people don't have the experience of what that really like, of what stillness is truly like. And so that has to be probably number one for me. Um, on the flip side of that, getting the mirrors and reflections from people that I have chosen to be in my physical circle that I want to spend time around, you know, we become so much of what we intake in life. And most people think it's just what they eat, but our mind and our subconscious mind is always on record. The conscious mind can accept and reject whatever is in our reality. You can say, I like this. I don't like that. But the subconscious mind is always accepting whatever is being exposed to it through the light that we see, through the words that we hear, through the thoughts that we think it's always picking up on that. And so I've, made it especially a thing over the past couple of years to be really discerning the individuals that I, that I place in my life to choose that the men, the brothers, the, the, those individuals that I keep in my life, that, uh, there's a level of work that they've done on themselves. And really it comes down to a lack of pretense. There's not something that we want from each other. There's not an agenda deeper behind, um, in just being a true connection, communion and relation with each other. And with that, you can blossom and, and share incredible, um, and share really just truthfully what's going on within your own mind, body, spirit, and allow that reflection and mirror to come back to you with a clean mirror. If somebody's got a dirty mirror, you don't necessarily want to look into it because you're not going to get a clear reflection. But if somebody's got a clear mirror, then it can be an incredible tool to see yourself through the eyes of another. And that's what we were talking to earlier. Like when you're single, you have maybe less triggers to work through because you're getting less mirrors and less reflections of your life. And so, um, you know, it's both my own process of growing my own self-awareness through stillness and then also choosing the individuals that I want to be around that can provide reflections for me, that I can provide reflections for them. And through that, we go in this beautiful spiral of self-awakening and yeah. That analogy with the mirrors and the house of mirrors it kind of reminds me if you choose to be around somebody that is not fully living in a integrity or ownership and more so living in a realm of production it kind of reminds me when you go to the fun houses and you look in the mirrors and they're distorted and you're like really long legs and a tiny torso and you're like oh my gosh what the heck am i doing you know that's also the the byproduct of a lack of discernment of choosing to surround ourselves with just merely because we don't want to be alone and feel lonely. So instead we choose the people to be around that actually are not fully walking a path of integrity or a path that we would want to walk ourselves. And so then we look in the reflection in the mirror and we see really, really long legs and a tiny torso and these tiny little T-Rex arms. And we're like, oh my God, I'm hideous through this reflection. And so it's like kind of, I've never used that analogy before, but it does remind me of that, that the mirror works both ways. And so there is something in what I talked about before about the time of being alone and noticing that desire and longing for, for a sense of safety from outside of myself. And to say, actually, I'd rather be lonely now and to start moving and transmuting this loneliness into self-validation in the, in, the, in the absence than to have the reflections merely because I'm just craving that perception, that that reflection but that reflection actually being distorted and so there's so much power in the self-validation before then choosing and the discernment of who then becomes a reflection and for me personally I've learned like I've gone from being somebody that I thrive like community is my lifeblood I just love community I love bringing like many humans together I love living in community it's just something that is so dear to me has been since I was a kid and in the same breath the more self-actualized the more self-realized I become the less mirrors I actually ask for and crave for um, and it's the crave has ch has transmuted from a need into a want and the want has become way more distilled down and so I can say that I'm plugged into a big community but the people that sit at the very intimate table of the reflections that I choose when I've lost my way or I don't know where my north and south is because I'm shrouded in in emotion those humans that I choose to reflect back to me are those that I would I, if I didn't have my life I wouldn't mind being and that being the default and that actually becomes like fair and few it's like not actually that many people and something that i have noticed within um also reflected back to you between us 
there is a very uncanny parallel that we always run and it is affirming um, in many different degrees to just the law of resonance ultimately and something that I have noticed is that you have recently created a, a men's group that is brothers that really 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 genuinely have each other's backs and I don't know what it is that you guys are doing when you're hanging out with each other but I can feel the impact of it as a woman that is craving safety because I think that most of my sisters just want to feel safe especially in the presence of a man most of us haven't actually had that imprint dating back to our father so to feel that sense of safety in another man is a paradigm shift in itself and witnessing the men over time invested within a safe space that you have pushed the first domino of and set this container I am watching my ability to converse with them from a deep place of presence there is a sense of full ownership of their experience that has integrated in there is a sense of grounded and rootedness in who they are and there is an opening that I feel within myself because my nervous system starts to feel safe in the presence of and I think that that is the dance between men and women and the masculine feminine the masculine feminine not being subjective to a sex but the 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 man and the woman dance and the polarity of that requires a deeply rooted sense of self within the man for a woman to be able to fully flourish and open up in her fluorescence and that's the alchemy that I'm noticing that is happening from the work that you're doing with your men's group as a woman that is experiencing the byproduct of what it is that you've cultivated so I'm curious to hear your perspective because I can already feel my my perspective of the importance of this work your perspective of the importance of brotherhood and what that actually means that's not just bros that like you know hang out and watch a football game together that's beautiful in itself and that has its own place but I want to hear what your definition of true, genuine brotherhood is and the principles that you've applied to your brotherhood that seem to be creating results. Yeah, I haven't shared too much about the men's group or brotherhood really too much. Recently just shared a little bit on my podcast with Matt, who's a brother in it, um, simply because it felt so... It, it felt like the purity of it. I just wanted to keep within the container within all the guys and everything. And, you know, I'm still, I guess, mindful of certain things that, that I share about it. But what I will say is it's, it's quickly become just one of the like most beautiful things in my life. Uh, there's something so deep. You know, like you spoke to the feminine essentially wants to feel that safety that the, 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 the river bed that holds the river or the garden bed that grows the flowers um, I think everybody in the group really has this commitment to radical authenticity and presence and kindness and also reverence for the feminine as well. You know, some of the guys are in partnership, but I think all of the guys uh, in total feel the power of the feminine essence. And so a lot of the work, honestly, over the past year has been rediscovering that feminine essence letting go of old outdated paradigms of who we think we are addressing the trauma that is you know causing people anxiety and fear i just think of how much pressure people put on their own romantic relationships trying to be and be everything for each other expect everything feel every need for each other and then resolve all of your human stuff within the container of one person and i see the way of the future as you know there's that saying the next buddha is a sangha Thich Nhat Hanh said the next Buddha is a Sangha, which is a community of individuals, a group of a collective that are, you know, holding that frequency within their heart. And I, and I feel that very strong. And the, the way also I see of just like the evolved romantic partnerships is for, there's something powerful when you separate the polarities, when women can have their women in their own women's circles, which they tend to are much more natural at, and they do that more effortlessly. <laughs> And then the men to have their own brotherhood. We have, we've lost these, society has lost these rites of passage, these initiations into uh, allowing men to hold the pain that men hold, which I feel like 
really only other men can can hold certain things within that depth because they understand it they're men right there's certain things that as women you are just going to be able to hold for each other and men won't be able to see as much so it's been such a beautiful process of meeting every month you know of doing these trips every six months or so and getting to the place of feeling really safe within the dynamics of the individuals which are all incredibly powerful business driven leaders in the world or you know, um, you know, musicians or uh, big business CEOs and founders, uh, but really just heart heart centered leaders is like the most important thing. And to be able to come together, just a, uh, you know, like a few weeks ago, one of the one of the guys was really struggling with something. He was having like a lot of anxiety, and um, he fa- we did like a group FaceTime within like fifteen minutes. Everybody was on the FaceTime group call, and we we're just holding space for him grounding him in he was like really releasing a lot and that to me is a representation of just the new paradigm and just to know that you're not alone and that you can be held and there's so much power and safe connection and brotherhood and uh, I feel really powerful about that and creating a blueprint potentially for people just to be able to enable more in your life you know it's it's not that complicated you call together six seven eight of your friends and instead of watching football or going on social media or talking about random stuff, have curated questions about what you're going through in life. What are your challenges? What are you struggling? And being able to just be in the reflection and there's so much power in just being witnessed, not even getting the reflection through the mirror of another person, getting their opinions and insights and different things like that, which can be valuable, but just being witnessed in whatever your shit is and to know that it's okay and that other people also have their shit there's something that diffuses the power and the grip that those neuroses have on you when they can just be witnessed in a safe container. So that's one thing. And then I see all the guys really incredibly powerful individuals and have shamanic tendencies and really are just deeply able to hold space for other people and share those potent reflections. And through that, there becomes this incredible catalyst and upward spiral of everyone's growth and with that, like the reflection on those mirrors of like the fun house, it gets clearer and clearer and cleaner and cleaner. And slowly you're reflecting less about your shadows and more about the light and helping you step into your bigness and what you're here to bring and share your gifts with the world. And that gets to be a really fun journey to go on. And so I feel really passionate about it. And it's been one of the greatest things in my life. And um, I can't take credit necessarily fully for bringing the group together, even though I kind of orchestrated the first thing, but it feels like Every single time when I, you know, do these mastermind dinners or like start at the men's group, there is a greater intelligence that comes into the room when the minds and hearts of many individuals come together. And so allowing for that intelligence to guide us, what is, what are these intuitive voices and um, what, what is life asking of us and how we can show up and starting to listen in that, in that greater intelligence, I feel like, uh, you know, it's guided us to some really incredible places. And so it's been a beautiful gift in my life, very grateful for it and passionate about sharing the message of the power of it for people to actually implement more in their life. Oh, I feel like I'm on the edge of tears every time you answer a question. (laughs) (laughs) Um, these ones are loaded with the realization of the importance I think about my sisters and I think about what it is that we share within our little groups of what it is that's on our hearts and what we're navigating in partnership, what we're navigating in our relationship to the masculine, what we're we're navigating with our relationship to men. Um, And when you're sharing, I just go into like an existential moment and I zoom out of Andre or any of the men in your group and more so about what this archetype or this journey actually looks like when it's multiplied, where this becomes more of the norm. And it's so rare and it's such a piercing pocket into something that feels so resonantly true to me and simultaneously so rare. And that is what makes me emotional is that simultaneously I mourn that this isn't more common. And in the same breath, I'm ecstatically joyful that this is even happening. And that I as a woman within the community and having close relationships with pretty much all of the men in your men's group as friends, um, I am being able to receive the gift that is being rippled out and it is like the champagne tower where it's, it's recognizing if you want to have champagne in every single glass you have to fill the top glass first and then it ripples over and what's happening in this space and from what you've shared and what I felt is like a, a very safe genuinely safe place and what I mean by safe place is that nobody's 
judging another person for their process but more so it's a permission slip for the process to be accessible for everybody in their own unique way but what that is 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 allowing a a, a healing of the way that they speak themselves and having a safe outlet for the repressed emotions that are being stuffed down their whole life so that then what's happening now is it's not coming out in partnerships or it's not coming out towards the the, the, the female uh, or towards women um, in, in relationship because it's an unhealed process within their own relationship to their own mother um, and vice versa for women, right? The importance of these spaces. And, and yet the thing that resonates so deeply true to me is that women just want to feel safe and, and men want to feel free. And this is something that we are still learning how to dance with. But first and foremost, we have to give that to ourselves. It's the only way we can give it to another. And to be able to give it to ourselves, sometimes we need other people. And I use the word need very little. But I think that we need each other. And that's what you're saying is we're moving and transcending from the epoch of that there's one person sitting on a pedestal or a podium and speaking to everybody else. And now we're actually moving into leadership behind the throne where it's stepping, allowing everybody to step into that position of leadership within their own nature, within their own relationship to themselves and therefore being able to give that from a synergetic standpoint, more like a, di- a, a dominion as opposed to a domination. And that is what I'm experiencing within your group. And it's also what I'm experiencing within my sisterhood and the women that I work with and, and the containers that have been cultivated. And like you said, it's so easy and natural for women to come together in circles with their titties out howling at the full moon. Like that for me, that's like default. <laughs> I know it's not everybody's default, but it is mine. Um, and and with the women that I work with, you know, I have Bernadette here in, in, in the studio and she's helping me weave, weave with the podcast but it's it's first and foremost sisterhood is having each other's back is being there in ceremony it's being there during full moods and then we co-create and we have a full momentum motion but it's from a understanding of that we're rooted in our prayer and we're holding each other with whatever it is that comes up and then we just so happen to be working together and co-creating so it brings me so much joy and peace and a resting within my spirit to know that even in my immediate reality this work is being done with men as well and I am so happy and grateful for the women that get to dance with the men of this group um, and to be able to experience a safe, healthy relationship. I have had the blessing of being able to experience that with you and um, that's something that creates a new default in my life for me moving forward as what it is that I'm calling into my life and how I'm relating to myself and the healing that continues to ripple long after the relationship has passed and is trans transformed into a friendship the healing still happens and so I'm just really emotional around feeling the amount of chaos that's happening in the world and then being able to taste truth or the closest thing to truth that I can possibly get to in my own psyche uh, my own conscious awareness in this present moment and so I just wanted to reflect that back in this the importance of what it is that's being cultivated and the gift that I get to receive through you, through the men in this group and the importance of this work on this planet at this time. Um, And I think that sometimes we can get into a place of inertia that there's so much that needs to be done on this planet every time we open social media there's another thing that we're being inundated with with wars on the planet people's lives are being lost the div- the, the separation and the division that is happening through i mean t- t- so many different pockets of life and we can get into this inertia that i don't even know what to do anymore i don't even know how i can support people that are in the middle east right now like how, what what can i do it feels almost like it feels almost like confusing to to be somebody that's on social media or to be utilizing social media as a platform of a message and then they're being they're putting this pressure on myself i need to speak into this topic and thinking that maybe if i make a post it might help but actually there are many layers and it's very nuanced however this actually what we're talking about is directly relating to the division that we see in the collective is a division that we're being able to heal within our own psyche and this is extremely powerful and sometimes it happens in silence sometimes it doesn't need to be super loud but it is making ripple effects to actually be able to heal the suffering within our own psyche and therefore create that vibrational contribution to the separation and the division that's happening on the walls on the planet now there are many many different degrees in which we can show up in service and support but i think that this is something that is incredibly important important in today's time and so andre thank you so much for um the path that you walk and when you said about 
the separation oh the, not separation the di- the difference and the evolution of how can I better myself to how can I be used for the service of the greater whole and how can I dance with what I have been given to be of service it creates a bigger bigger perspective that doesn't stop with the mind um and something else that I want to reflect on that you bring that you and I both bring into each other's life through our friendship and through the way that we we weave in the world is as you know and as people that listen to the podcast I'm deeply rooted in the Gene Keys the Gene Keys is an incredible guide and teacher for me and something that you have double of and I have double of yours is double um intellect in the shadow the gift of precision and the city the enlightened aspect of impeccability if you have it double so if you ever have anything double it's a superpower it's also a super challenge is the intellect um processing everything through the mind and becoming a little bit rigid is the shadow of it now the impeccability is how i th- i believe that you live your life like y- impeccable is probably one of the main words that i would just dis- you choose to describe you the double that I have, I have multiple doubles, but one of them is the double shadow of distraction, the gift of freshness, and no, not freshness, sorry, distraction, um, and oh my goodness, distraction and intoxication with the gift of mindfulness, um, and the city is what the city intoxication huh the the city is intoxication so the combination that you and i i feel like that you and i have for each other is that in the shadow i'm extremely distracted and you're processing it through the mind Mm -hmm. um and and creating a rigidity and i'm like not here and i'm like constantly going over for the short hits and and the and the serotonin and the dopamine excitement of like oh um however in the highest expression and the reflection of each other is impeccable intoxication and i think that that actually perfectly describes us when we are fully whole beings coming in collaboration Mm -hmm. and that's something that i want to wrap up this entire podcast with a bow is recognizing that the human can exist and when we can understand the human and have a safe place within a, a partnership that has transitioned into a friendship but it continued over time invested to pr- to ensure that this is actually a safe place that our intellect and our distraction can exist because without that we cannot experience the impeccable intoxication that is also our collaborative um uh, combined superpowers and one of the final piece around the partnership dynamics and something that I have extracted that has been the first ever in my entire 32 years of being on this planet that I've been able to access this kind of love is to witness you be in partnership with somebody else and to genuinely celebrate it. That has been something that I have not actually had access to before I've always turned it in on my own personal experience made myself less than felt jealousy felt like I wasn't enough and made it about myself which ensures or would insinuate that I am conditionally loving you right and to genuinely witness you in partnership or in connection with another being that doesn't involve me and genuinely be in celebration for you has freed me into genuine unconditional love and it's the first time that i've been able to have access to that because i've never seen it modeled before and i have been imprisoned by it simultaneously but felt like i did not have access to be able to let go and through this friendship i have been able to access genuine unconditional love and what that's done is it planted a seed in my psyche of the default that I wish to embody moving forward in any kind of partnership. So I wanted to also speak into that piece because I know that I'm going back to an original part of the conversation. However, it was it felt like an important part that I wanted to weave into this conversation is now for the first time in my entire life, I understand what unconditional love is and it is all encompassing. Unconditional love doesn't care what you wear. Unconditional love doesn't care if you have a pimple on your forehead (laughs) or how you present yourself, whether you're in your shadow or in your light or in your story or in the liberation. Unconditional love is unwavering. It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't change. It is a default of all of life and all of creation, all of nature. And it's something that humanity has drifted so far away from. 
and I didn't realize that I had drifted so far away from it because I was born into conditions all of us are born in, into conditions to some degree and so within this friendship and this partnership and this soul contract I have been able to taste unconditional love and I think that that is the greatest gift one can ever 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 receive because it can last for a lifetime and so I just wanted to acknowledge that and so thank you for the gift of being able to taste what unconditional love is and to now understand the direction that I want to move in moving forward mm. as a human on planet earth mm. Thank you so much for that reflection and just sharing. And yeah, the like the, the couple of times that I've, you know, been exploring potential partnership with somebody, you know, I was like over the past couple of years, like dating a girl or something, you'd, if it got to that point, you know, where like you would like, if you, if they're in, cause everyone's a community here, it's like, it's a, a tight circle. So it's inevitable that you'll, you know, be weaving or see each other. And so I've, those couple of times where you have like gotten lunch with them or like, you know, giving your blessing or just like, uh, you know, showing up and choosing to to operate from unconditional love is really beautiful to see as well. While I'm not in partnership now, I think it's a it's a beautiful thing to celebrate and hold out for each other. You know, as new connections come up, as they inevitably will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> You yeah. are a wellspring of, of knowledge and integrated wisdom. Ditto. Ditto, Bluebee. <laughs> say, say the same for you. And um, thank you so much for, for coming on my podcast. It's been a journey. And for those that have been able to tune into the podcast from the get go, they will sit with me by my side and understand my emotions that I, I navigate and move through. And there is something so real and true for me about coming on the podcast and just sharing these vulnerable truths and yeah. these vulnerable experiences. And of course, there's a part of me that like I, I I'm learning astrology at the moment and um, I'm doing a class with Deborah Silverman and I'm understanding my astrology chart and I have Leo and um, Scorpio, which is a squared in my chart. And if you have a square of anything, it means that they fight against each other or like there's like tension towards them so there's the leo and me which is all like share everything and just be completely transparent and just lay it all out on the table and then the scorpio and me, me fights that and then after i share i go into a vulnerability hangover and i just hide away and i close and i go into my scorpio cave um and so i have definitely been in the dance with that on the podcast uh but the thing that makes the most sense to me is to create conversations that i needed a few years ago and I wanted access to and I couldn't find because there's just so many filters and so many doled down around our vulnerability and to be vulnerable in a public way it comes with a big cost and yet it's the choiceless choice because it feels like at least there can be spaces like your podcast my podcast has multiple places that now there are people that are really being able to bring down their filters and just sharing a, a little insight and a look into these what into these narratives um however being able to just take everybody on this journey of the unfolding that has continued to happen between us and something that is one of my greatest blessings in my life is that outside of our romantic partnership we've now created and formed a partnership in friendship that just seems to be that we are co-creating beautiful experiences whether it's community gatherings or um, dinners or creative projects that we have on the horizon but the container has changed shape but has not changed the depth of the love and so now that I know this is possible I'm so excited to talk about it on the podcast and to share it from a genuinely authentic place um, and not necessarily just presenting all the polished versions of ourselves or the awakened aha moments but also the grief and the sadness and the guilt and the shame and the guilt and the jealousy and the un uncertainty and I think that that's also just what makes us human and so we can continue to share our authentic hearts. Um, yeah. Yeah. And for anybody that is going through or one day inevitably will go through a separation with partnership, just to remind them that it is possible that the love can just take on new forms. And if it's not romantic partnership, then it can be in the full celebration of others to know that it's possible, you know, to have that reference point, I think is important. And uh, so let's keep on doing that. And it's fun to weave and plan, you know, trips for people and, and, you know, later this year a trip that we're going to go on with some people and uh continue to weave and share our voice on podcasts and all the things so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah well i'm really grateful and just honored that i get to keep you in my life um Likewise. as as um, one of my best friends and the greatest inspirations and um 
you've also been working on some cool things behind the scene. <laughs> you've got your first ever like proper official course. We did a podcasting course once, but it was sort of like, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of hours and it was a Zoom call and, and showing our wisdom collectively. But there is something that you've really been working on and, you know, to the point where he has his phone on airplane, not airplane mode, do not disturb mode all day long so that he can focus on what it is that he's got in hand without any distractions. So what is it that you're creating right now? Yeah, I've I've really felt into how I can show up, serve, and simultaneously grow the platform, the business, and everything kind of simultaneously. And, you know, one thing that I'm sure a lot of listeners that are tuning into this episode right now feel the urge to share themselves as a creator. And um, something I'm very passionate about is this conjunction between conscious individuals and creating media and like, you know, medicine for the world and, and sharing in that way. And so over the past, like probably five, six months, I've really kind of committed to creating a whole course around podcasting. And for anybody that wants to start a podcast that has a podcast that wants to grow an existing podcast or is just interested in the whole industry, podcasting, as you know, and I know is one of the most incredible things in modern age is like, I learned so much from podcasts starting my own. It's been the greatest joy. And I've created uh, an incredible course and blueprint for people to follow to start a podcast, how to know what you want to call your podcast and name it and what's it going to be about to iterating the guests and how to get the guests on your show and the hosting and distribution and how to actually use the equipment and record it and monetize your show and grow it and like support you along that process. And so, yeah, by the time this podcast comes out, it'll probably be out there so people can check that out. We'll mm -hmm. like leave a link in the description or something. Playing with names, I think it's going to be called Podcast with Purpose. And it just feels like a really beautiful thing to support and empower creators and potential po potential podcasters uh, with the tools and understanding and awareness to really uh, pour fuel on that fire and, mm -hmm. and share their voice and medicine with the world. So, yeah, it's exciting. And like I said in the introduction of you, you are one of the main reasons as to why the Deja Vu podcast is what it is today with the professional fame, with the right amount, right, right equipment, how to put on the show notes and the YouTube titles and the thumbnails. and the, I mean, there is an immense amount of work that goes on behind the scenes and it's so easy to go, oh, I like listening to podcasts. I want to podcast myself. But right. it's like, that's beautiful. It's the fool in the tarot where it's just like kind of like leaning off the edge of a cliff, smiling, being like, <laughs> I have no idea what I'm getting myself into. And there's a naivety to it. Simultaneously, naivety part is it. It can be a blessing because it starts the journey for you without getting too much in your mind and partner with some good amount of logic yeah. and understanding and education because it can ensure that there is consistency that happens. Most podcasts don't get past episode seven because once you get to episode seven, you realize how much work it is behind the scenes. Um, and so to be able to be educated in this before you start your journey so that you feel like there's the chariot card and also the tarot, which is about making sure that everything is in order. You have uh, you have assessed all all potential timelines you are educated you've got everything strapped in before you start your journey um, it can be extremely helpful as you go on this podcasting journey and simultaneously once you get a well-oiled system in place and you've been educated by the best in the game i'm gonna have to say <laughs> that just the best in the game um then you are gonna be way more likely gonna hit your target of your goals what it is that you want to create and i can hand on heart tell you that we cannot have enough heart centered voices out there in the world we need it right now and so instead of getting into the court into the narrative that there's just too many podcasts everybody and their mama has got a podcast why would i start one why have i got anything to say that any of any value well who are you not to share your voice when it's genuinely rooted from a heart-centered place because i can tell you right now mainstream media is just not doing it and we don't wake up anymore and we don't watch the news for the most part most people listening to this podcast do not even have a tv but we do wake up and we go on Instagram and we watch other people's stories. We do wake up and we scroll through our phones um, or ideally not if you're applying Andre's business. <laughs> um, but that we have become the media. And so what would it look like for more heart-centered voices out in the world from a professional frame who create a sustainability so that can actually hit the impact and not just ju just be concerned by the, the intention, but align with our impact too. And so this is an incredible opportunity mm. for those that genuinely are curious by this path to be able to learn from the best in the game which i have and this is where we are at now with with the uh, season three and continue to crush it <laughs> um <laughs> thank, thank you andre so much thank for you. for being here and sharing your wisdom and for your transparency and your vulnerability and 
Classic case scenario, Blue cries on a podcast again. <laughs> <laughs> but that one actually hit really deep and I'm going to have to integrate it a little bit after this podcast. I think I have a, Bernadette was also crying on the side. We're all having a little more oh. emotional moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you so much for being here. And and I, I'm just, yeah, I think I've tutored your horn quite a lot on this podcast. <laughs> I definitely <laughs> done it enough, but I do that. It's just genuine to me. Yeah. And um, thank you so much. I look forward to continuing to weave with you and doing another podcast later down the line to see where we're at then and to share more insights and things that we have learned. And um, yeah, if you have any final things that you want to share? Just thank you for choosing to show up the way that you do. I think that your audience is, especially for the size of it, so... Uh, so connected with you and feel like they're there in the room when you do podcasts and really connect with you because you are that open book and you wear your heart on your sleeve and you share so authentically and so vulnerably. And because of that, I think people just really resonate with what you share and they respect your word. And I think that you're an incredible, and I always have since I met you, just an incredible representation of the divine feminine and how it's choosing to show up in the planet. And, uh, and so by you choosing to show up the way that you do, you become that possibility for for so many people and so just thank you for being you excited to continue weaving and maybe we can play a little hand pan <laughs> that's right and you I said you wanted forgot. to do that i'm so excited so the other night i was at andre's house and um we used to play the hand pan like way back in the day when we were together and I, he actually, through the, the gift of the community, had orchestrated me to get a community gift, which was the hand pan and a few other things, which was, Andre was really good at the birthdays. <laughs> and we haven't played the hand pan together in years. And it was an intuitive, spontaneous moment. We were surrounded by our friends. We we're sitting on the floor. I got the hand pan out and then I just looked at Andre, who was happened to be sitting opposite me. And I was like, you want to go? You want to play? And there wasn't even really a moment of thought. It was just a yes. We took off our rings. We got to take off your rings before you play. And we just started playing. And I just, we just had a moment where there were no words, but our souls got to reconnect from a the same rhythm it was like an unspoken rhythm that started pulsing through me through you and then through me and then one of your friends about our friends reflected back saying it was like you guys were like merging i didn't know where he began and you ended and it was just this this, this merging through the the handpan so i brought the handpan down today and we could just close out this podcast with with sharing a little bit of handpan music and being able to play together play and pray together in a good way <laughs> let's do it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Before we go into the hand pan, if you resonate with today's episode and it feels something that's true in your heart and you feel like could benefit other people, then please go ahead and share it on your Instagram stories. Tag myself and Andre so that we can also repost it and continue to spread this message in a good way. We cannot spread this message without you far and wide. And so if it feels true for you, remembering that the bluebirds represent representation of beauty, love, and unity. And so it is individuals that are choosing to walk their own authentic path of spreading beauty, love, and unity in your own unique way. And so if this episode resonates with that and resonates with you, then please go ahead and share it. And it would mean so much to us. If you're watching on YouTube, then go ahead and press the subscribe button so that you can stay in touch with all of the latest episodes that are being shared. And also for Andre's podcasting class, it the information will be in the show notes and everything that you need to do to find Andre and continue to follow him along his journey and to be a part of the movement of love and the reclamation of empowerment within our own hearts, then go ahead and just follow him over on Instagram, YouTube, podcast, know thyself and all of the magical things. <laughs> Until next week, thank you so much for tuning in. I am sending you so much love. And without further ado, I hope you enjoy the handpan music. <laughs>